So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming uh, to uh, one of our 50th anniversary of the HKU Faculty of Law Lectures. Uh, it is my tremendous honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Justice Carlos Bernal of the Colombian Constitutional Court uh, and his lecture on the topic of Is Transformative Constitutionalism an Illusion? Uh, Justice Bernal is a uh, distinguished scholar and jurist and as students in my comparative constitutional law class discovered for themselves on Wednesday, also a very talented teacher. So he is one of these folks who puts all of us to shame along every dimension uh, and is uh, an, ex and an utter gentleman about it at every turn. So. Uh, if I may give some of his introductions, Justice Bernal, had, before joining the Colombian Constitutional Court uh, in 2017, uh, taught at the uh, Macquarie University in Australia and as well at the University of Florida, where he received one of his two doctoral degrees, <laughs> his other doctorate being from uh, the University of Salamanca. Uh, he also holds uh, his law degree from the Universidad Externado de Colombia uh, and uh, the SJD from Salamanca and his MA and PhD in philosophy from the University of Florida. He has taught uh, at the universities of uh, Paris Sorbonne and Nanterre, uh, the University of Lyon, and has held fellowships at Yale Law School, King's College, and the Max Planck Institute, with which many of you I know are familiar. Uh, so Justice Bernal obviously will be speaking from great experience. Anyone in the world of uh, comparative constitutional law knows that the Colombian Constitutional Court is a court of great consequence, and it is no overstatement to say that Justice Bernal truly serves his nation uh, at great, uh, and he and his colleagues serve the nation at, at no small cost and risk to themselves. Uh, and it is, I think, also safe to say that the Colombian Constitutional Court has, is a leading example of a court that has assisted in transition to peace and democracy. Some of us, myself included, uh, like to play the role of skeptic and to cast doubt on the value of judicial review and on the value of constitutional courts more generally, and then we were reminded, in person no less, by people such as Justice Bernal and by the example of the Colombian Constitutional Court, really no stronger argument could be made for the importance and value of such institutions. So with no further ado, Justice Bernal will be speaking for about uh, 35 minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you'll join me giving a warm welcome to Justice Bernal. Thank you so much, David, for this wonderful invitation to uh, come here and for the presentation. I would like also to thank everyone for taking the time to attend this, this lecture. The topic of my lecture is the question, is transformative constitutionalism an illusion? Courts and commentators uh, have a tribute to some constitutions like the Constitution of South Africa or the Colombian Constitution or the Brazilian Constitution a transformative commitment. This attribution gives rise at least to four puzzles. I will call them the conceptual puzzle, the possibility puzzle, the institutional puzzle, and the performance puzzle. Let me start with the conceptual puzzle. The conceptual puzzle refers to the question, how to understand transformative constitutionalism? A glimpse of existing literature reveals that there are broader and narrower conceptions of transformative constitutionalism. Broader conceptions point to the aspiration that the Constitution transforms political and social institutions and power relationships in a democratic, participatory, and egalitarian directions. For example, from a broader point of view, Carl Clare, who was the South African scholar that for the first time spoke about this idea of transformative constitutionalism, associated the 1996 South African Constitution with the transformation, and I quote, of the political and social institutions and power relationships in a democratic, part participatory, and egalitarian direction. Also, from a broader perspective, a German scholar, Michaela Heilbrunner, recently linked transformative constitutionalism, and I quote, with a broader emancipatory commitment to use law as steer state action and drive social change toward a uh, towards a more just and equal society. On the other hand, narrower, narrower perspectives refer to a commitment to transform certain features of society, such as inequality and poverty. 
For instance, from an hour perspective, in the case Subramoni versus Minister of Health, speaking for the majority of the South African Constitutional Court, Justice uh, Chas Chaskelson claimed that the 1996 Constitution had a commitment to transform certain features of the society, such as great disparities in wealth, the fact that millions of people are living in deplorable conditions and in a great poverty, a high level of unemployment, inadequate social security, and a lack of a universal access to clean water or to adequate health services. The conceptual puzzle expresses the question whether transformative constitutionalism should be understood with a broader or a narrower conception. The variety of conceptions concerning this concept reflect a profound disagreement concerning two key conceptual matters. The first one is, what are the features of society that transformative constitutionalism is expected to change? And the second one is, what are the content and extent of the expected transformations? Are those institutionalization of democracy? If so, of what kind? Deliberative, participatory, Respect of human rights, elimination of poverty, reduction of inequality, satisfaction of economic and social rights. Of course, disagreement about these matters have an impact on the assessment of the performance of transformative constitutionalism. The more and deeper features of society are embedded in the expected transformations, the less probabilities of success can transformative constitutionalism have. The opposite also applies. For instance, the claim that constitutionalism has transformed democracy in Latin America because nowadays there are regular elections in all countries is, has been a constant claim uh, that, for instance, a group in the Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany have made when they talk about transformative constitutionalism. But of course, this is a very thinner uh, idea. The, just the idea that this new wave of constitutions that were enacted at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s in Latin America have transformed society because right now there are free elections everywhere. It's a, it's a very thin uh, um, claim. Also, the greater the content and the higher the extent of the expected transformations, the less probabilities of success can transformative constitutionalism have. And the opposite also applies. One uh, example is uh, the claim that constitutionalism is a hollow hope in Latin America because of the increasing inequalities in all countries. There is uh, also skeptic, uh, skeptic literature in Colombia and in Brazil pointing that uh, all this story that we are living in Latin America from the uh, end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s is just uh, an illusion because at the end, when we measure, we don't get better results. Let me go to the second puzzle, which is the possibility puzzle. The possibility puzzle is, puzzle is whether constitutionalism can indeed be transform transformative. Uh, the term constitutionalism refers to a descriptive and a normative claim. The descriptive claim states that government is created and structured by means of legal norms. The normative claim is that the exercise of government should be limited by those legal norms. While the latter claim explains the status quo, the second claim somehow justify its perpetuation. These two claims show why transformative constitutionalism gives rise to a paradox. It is paradoxical to expect, to expect at the same time from constitutionalism to perpetuate the status quo and to transform it. The possibility puzzle expresses then the question as to how this paradox, this paradox is to be solved. Furthermore, it implies asking whether the directive function of constitutions and its institutional implications suffice for transforming troubled societies. From the theoretical point of view, the possibility puzzle has an easy solution. This solution consists in acknowledging that constitutionalism has a positive, positive dimension besides its negative dimension. 
In addition to the claim that the legal norms creating an structuring government limit the exercise of power by political authorities, this is the negative dimension, transformative constitutionalism implies recognizing that those norms empower political authorities and allocate upon them the duty to implement suitable means for achieving the expected transformations. We can call this the positive dimension. However, the solution is not too easy from the empirical and institutional perspective. First, it is doubtful that in troubled and poor countries, within the framework of globalization, the means that political authorities can implement are actually suitable for achieving the expected transformations. Second, even if they were suitable, transformative constitutionalism should not necessarily be associated with their implementation. For instance, diligent political authorities can implement good policies for reducing inequality or poverty regardless of whether they operate in an environment of a transformative constitution. And third, this is very important, it is difficult to create a, caus a causal connection between transformative constitutionalism and the achievement of the expected transformations. For instance, it is uncertain whether the last wave of the Latin American constitution is at least somehow the cause of the reduction of inequality and poverty in the region. There is a little bit of reduction improvement in those areas. However, we don't know if transformative constitutionalism or this allocation to the constitution of the transformative function is, is actually a cause of that. All factors such as you know, globalization, the increase in foreign investment can also account for it. But let me talk a little bit about the performance pu puzzle. Um, this puzzle refers to the fact that um, here, that there is disparity in the literature concerning the question on whether transformative constitutions have actually produced the desired changes, or if they have only become an intended, and I, I will use here a concept that David crafted, sham constitutions. Um, and here we have also disparity in the literature. For instance, uh, David and Mila, Mila's research is one, a wonderful piece that shows that uh, if you have beautiful constitutions in some countries and then you measure the outcomes that those constitutions are supposed uh, to uh, bring about, then you can, you can point to these countries in the, in the bottom of the list of the countries that have achieved those uh, outcomes. Then uh, this, this uh, literature is um, is skeptical, as, as uh, David pointed out. On the other hand, we have optimistic literature. For instance, I remember uh, three, four years ago, I was in Sydney, and uh, David Bilchitz, who is a, a scholar from South Africa, he had performed an analysis of the performance of the South African Constitution, and he tried to convince, to convince an audience of 20 South Africans and me that the South African constitution is very successful as a, as a transformative constitution. I think he published this research online in the website of the IDEA uh, Institute. Um, the, the only problem was that the only South African in the room that was convinced about that was him. All of them, all of the rest were skeptical and uh, 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 claimed that uh, he created uh, uh, some kind, uh, some strategies to measure that, that at the end uh, uh, led him to that conclusion. But they were, they were skeptical, uh, not only about the out outcomes, but also about the, the methodology. Of course, here we have a big problem is, again, how to measure the performance. What criteria, what indicators can, can we use to connect actually the performance of a constitution uh, with some uh, social outcomes. Then let me focus in the um, institutional puzzle. Uh, the institutional puzzle relates to the question, what institution, institutional arrangements does the implementation of transformative constitutionalism presuppose? 
Scholars usually point to an active role to con of constitutional and supreme courts concerning the implementation of, of the means leading to the desired transformations. It's also, it also matters how those apex courts perceive themselves. For instance, my court, the Colombian Constitutional, Constitutional Court, has perceived itself as a transformative court, in particular concerning the enforcement of economic and social rights. This self-perception perception has led the court to issuing two singular kinds of remedies, strong remedies in individual cases, like for instance, uh, some of my colleagues, I, I don't do this, I'm going to explain this, but some of my colleagues just order, comment a measure, please, you have, uh, no please, you have 10 days to build a school, and the major says, how, I don't know, but you have 10 days to do it, and that's it. At the end, no one can comply, and that's a big issue. And also, structural remedies. Structural remedies. Those remedies, especially the structural remedies, have challenged a traditional conception of the strict separation of powers and the view that remedies cannot transcend, transcend the parties of a case. For example, in iconic cases, such as the judgment concerning the protection of economic and social rights of internally displaced people, the court has used a strong strategy that combines four elements. The declaration of, and this is a concept crafted by, by the court, and, con, and unconstitutional state of affairs, unconstitutional state of affairs, which means that the reality is not as it's supposed to be according to the constitution because of many institutional blockages and also lack of diligence of the uh, officials. This is the first element. Second, the building of a structural case where they put together some many claims of many people. Then the choice of a structural remedies, like for instance, uh, commanding the Congress to allocate uh, a part of the budget to some social uh, issue, or uh, creating institutions or creating mechanisms to coordinate institutions. And finally, retaining jurisdiction for supervising compliance with the remedies. Those are the four, the four elements. However, do APEX courts actually have the capacity to carry out the expected transformation? Are those strong remedies suitable? Some decisions by courts, such as the Colombian, the South African, or the Brazilian constitutional courts in Brazil, is called the Supreme Federal Tribunal, have undoubtedly brought relief to vulnerable people, fed public debate, and led uh, to legislation and policies aiming to transform in fields like the satisfaction of economic rights. Uh, one example in Colombia is the right to health after a huge structural judgment, then the Congress passed a law uh, to improve the health system, and uh, there is a case, this is a good case, this is a case in which we have some tangible outcomes of, a, of, a, um, of um, uh, first an idea of a structural judgment and then led to, to a good policy implemented by the Congress. However, there are reasons for skepticism concerning the capacity of courts for carrying out the expected transformation. The first one is that strategic, lit strategic litigation, which is very, very effective in some of these countries, for instance in Colombia, a very good business is to uh, create an NGO and get money from the Norwegians and then do strategic lit litigation, um, can erode deliberative democracy. Courts are becoming the target of interest groups that by means of strategic litigation want to achieve an, ambas an advancement of interest that in a constitutional democracy after broad deliberation should be openly balanced by the legislature with other competing interests. This could weaken re representative participatory and deliberative democracy. Elected, elected authorities could lose initiative to undertake social, uh, social changes that the court will undertake. In some cases, for instance, we have senators and politicians requesting us to solve a social problem by means of a judgment instead of them discussing a piece of legislation, allocating the budget, and uh, uh, they, they are quitting they, uh, their, their job. They are renouncing to do their job because they think it's much better if you have 
uh, a majority of people at the, uh, in the court commanding them to do that. Also, citizens could prefer litigating rather than mobilizing, and political deliberation could constrain itself to constitutional argument argumentation. The protection of labor rights in Colombia, for instance, offers a clear example of this phenomenon. Multiple court decisions granting stability to workers in vulnerable circumstances have neither trigger consequential changes in legislation nor ordinary labor law jurisprudence yet. Instead, to pressure an update of legislation, worker, workers plead their cases directly to constitutional judges via a kind of constitutional complaint that we have that is called tutela. Since, hence, there hasn't been democratic deliberation and financial thinking on as to whether employers in Colombia can provide for all those benefits. This leads to a second problem. Due to the epistemic, to the epistemic disadvantages of courts, well-intended intent decisions could be counterproductive uh, to achieve or in the, in the task of achieving the expected transformations. For instance, three years ago, my court, in the, the, the constitutional court before I, before I began my term, they made a decision that, uh, seeked, uh, that sought to protect the, sp the stability of female workers when the employer fired them without knowing that they were pregnant without knowing that they were pregnant. The court decided that if an employer, for instance, uh, terminate the employment of um, a female worker, and then she says that she was pregnant, and the employer, he didn't know, the court ruled that the employer has to, had to pay the social security for her until the end of the pregnancy, and then six months more during the breastfeeding time. Guess what happened? This created, um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, an attitude of employers of not hiring women in the, in the age in which they can become pregnant and to prefer men. Why? Because they didn't want, they didn't want to expose themselves to that risks. Then when I entered the court, we had a very tricky situation is that we had a feminist organization asking us to change that ruling to change that ruling and to change the rule uh, and because they, they wanted to achieve a, a parity, a gender parity in the hiring of the persons of that age group. And then we had to, we had to change the rule and in another ruling um, in which exactly was the, uh, we, had, we had exactly that situation, a female worker was fired and then uh, she, she, didn't know, she didn't know she was, uh, she was pregnant, and then she notified the employer. Then we commanded uh, the social security system, the state, to offer the protection to her, but not uh, to, uh, and we changed the rule according to which the employer was the person who had the burden uh, to pay for that uh, costs. Now, another problem is that is an, increasing, an increase in the judi judicialization of politics and, and an over-constitutionalization of justice. For instance, in Colombia, all, just, all judges are competent to decide constitutional cases concerning constitutional rights, to tell our cases. Data show that this task fills about 30% of the workload of every justice in the country, every judge. Hence, the work on ordinary criminal, civil, commercial, and labor law cases becomes residual. Ordin uh, ordinary justice is losing its nature as the ordinary way to resolve legal conflicts. Moreover, there is a hollowing of competences, for instance, of labor, civil, uh, criminal justice, uh, judges, and contradictions between labor law and constitutional law jurisprudence, civil law, constitutional law jurisprudence. Also, ambitious decisions made by the Constitutional Court can become inefficacious, given that most of them require active cooperation by all branches of government. This could increase mistrusting state, mistrust in state institutions and even in constitutional justice. For instance, since 1998, there have been multiple court decisions concerning the constitutional rights of inmates. Moreover, the Constitutional Court has retained supervisory jurisdiction for overseeing compliance 
with the orders. The court keep issuing decisions reminding compliance with the original orders and adding some orders, some more orders. This is an indicator that very small progress uh, is, um, is, is made in achieving the desired transformation. Right now the situations in jails are exactly the same as 20 years before. And of course, the government is, is putting more money, but it, is, this is not an issue that a court can solve by means of adjustment. Also, a strategic, a strategic use of transformative constitutionalism can lead to distortions. For instance, uh, for, um, Otavio Ferraz, who is a friend who works in, in, uh, in London in the King's College, and David Landau, who is a common friend that works in, in Florida, they have highlighted that concerning economic and social rights, the constitutional systems in Brazil and Colombia uh, have granted priority to the protection of middle and up, upper class interests, which are well represented in litigation um, and acquire over the protection of rights of the poorest and most vulnerable uh, people. Naturally, decisions with general effects such as, the, uh, including, uh, such as those including the structural remedies are better suited to protect vulnerable people. However, almost all decisions, at least corresponding to constitutional cases, concern individual complaints. The most vulnerable people are less able to file well-argued complaints and to trigger decisions by constitutional judges than middle class and upper class people. Then this, this means that the transformation is done for a sector that doesn't meet the transformation. For instance, there are many people that uh, need, a, need a, a medicine they can pay for that, but they prefer to file a tutela. You don't need a lawyer to do that, and then you can get the, you can get the drug, you can get the medicine. Uh, due to lack of uh, education, the poorest people of the country, they don't know that this is possible, and they, they, they wouldn't approach a court to, to request a medicine that they actually need and that they cannot buy. In this regard, transformative constitutionalism is to a remarkable extent an illusion. A way to mitigate those side effects is redesigning and rethinking the activist role of, of apex court into a model of dialogical system that highlights the functions of the legislature and the executive, the administration, and the contribution to the transformation of private and, and even international powers as well. In this model, courts have what I call a catalyzing role for instance, in recent cases, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk here about a couple of cases that I drafted, and this is, those are successful experiments that I have had, at least in individual cases. In recent cases, the Colombian Constitutional Court has begun experimenting with deliberative remedies in which the court catalyzes engagement between the plaintiff and political authorities. The basis of those experiments is the attempt to maximize effectiveness in the realization of economic and social rights, whilst at the same time minimize the interference with the principle of separation of powers and the problem of epistemic disadvantage that we have as constitutional judges. For instance, in a judgment, the judgment T91 of the year 2018, um, we can find an example in which ju judges can play this catalytic role. Ten mid middle school students requested the educational authorities of a, of a poor small town in a region devastated by the Colombian internal armed conflict to open a high school. Due to financial restrictions, a decree provides that only if there is a minimum of 22 students, a high school class can be opened. Grounded in this provision, the education agency denied the request. Then the students filed a constitutional complaint requesting the protection of their right to education. The constitutional court considered the case. The court had at least three possibilities at hand concerning its role. First, it could have deferred to the judgment of political authorities and say, you know, it's not unreasonable, you have that decree, that's it. Second, it could have issued a strong remedy, as for instance one colleague 
of mine uh, who wrote a dissenting opinion argued, and it could have commanded authorities to open the high school. Some of my colleagues would do this, just command the political authority to open the high school. While the former would not have efficiently protected the right, the, the latter would have resulted in a strong interference with education policies and budget distribution. And I, it, very probably do nothing because at the end, those authorities don't have the money to open the high school. Instead, the court followed a catalyt catalytic strategy. During the proceedings, the court began a dialogue with the educational authorities. We just called them by phone. The court asked what possibilities were available for offering the students spots in high school classes in the neighbor towns. The education agency identified two high, school, two high schools 20 kilometers away where the students could continue their education. In the judgment, the court ordered the authorities to initiate a process of meaningful dialogue with the climate and to agree upon two matters. In which high school would the students continue their education and how the educational authorities would fund the transportation, which is not too expensive. The engagement between the climates and the authorities was very fruitful. After a few days, they achieved an agreement. The students are now enrolled in a high school and the municipal government is funding the transportation. This catalytic approach enables the court to deliberate with political authorities for implementing transformative policies and measures. The question is whether there are ways to prove that this is a better strategy for improving the effectiveness of transformative constitutionalism. Many thanks.